This story is entitled Pioneers of Flight, uh, despite the presence of an aeroplane, because it is as much about four early aviation pioneers as it is about an aircraft. The tale of the Curtis Goopy Duck is an interesting little account that starts in the early days of aviation, earlier than you might expect. Unusually, it's an aircraft whose capability for flight was neither experimental nor commercial. And with an opening like that, it requires a little context. On the 17th of December 1903, the Wright brothers are generally acknowledged to have been the first to achieve powered controlled flight. Following up in 1906, they received a patent for their method of lateral control, which centred around wing warping, although they acknowledged that other methods were possible. Lateral control is, needless to say, a rather important part of keeping an aircraft in the air, affecting as it does the side-to-side -side role of an aeroplane. This was an issue that had been researched and experimented with by aviation pioneers long before the Wright's historical first flight. The most obvious and visible clue to the successful implementation of some means of lateral control is an aircraft's ability to do a controlled turn. The Wright brothers' intent with their filing was to gain a monopoly over flight so that anyone building aircraft would have to pay a royalty to use their patent. Wilbur Wright's opinion on the subject is very clear. On January the 20th, 1910, he stated in a letter to Octave Chanute, a supporter and collaborator of the Wrights, that, and I quote, it is our view that morally the world owes its almost universal use of our system of lateral control entirely to us. It is also our opinion that legally it owes it to us. The emphasis is mine. Wing warping is just one way of achieving lateral control, affecting as it does the shape of the wing to achieve aerodynamic effect. It has pros and cons that I won't get into here, but for a short time it was a prominent feature of early aircraft, lasting as a serious option until about 1915. The most famous proponent of wing warping was probably Anton Fokker, who persisted with it through the early part of World War I, despite it being clear that his aircraft had become obsolete as a result. Famously, in 1908, aviation pioneer Glenn Curtis attempted to use ailerons to get around the Wright patent. He wasn't the first to use ailerons in manned flight. That honour goes to Robert Esnaud Pelterie in his glider of 1904, and in fact ailerons had been patented in 1868 by British scientist Matthew Piers Watt Bolton. Ailerons are a much more effective and straightforward solution to lateral control, using movable flaps in the wings to get the same result as wing warping. It's entirely possible that if there had been more awareness of Bolton's patent, the Wright's patent of 1906 might never have been granted. Regardless, Curtis was sued for patent infringement by the Wrights, and so began the infamous Wright Brothers patent war that dragged on for years. Of course, the whole story is a lot more complicated than that. To fully cover it would require a full-blown documentary series. Right, so now we have some context. Glenn Hammond Curtis was an aviation pioneer contemporary with the Wright brothers and one of the founders of the United States aircraft manufacturing industry. He got his start, so to say, as a bicycle messenger and racer and a bicycle shop owner. As motorcycles began to become popular, he developed an interest in those and in the accompanying internal combustion engines. In 1902, he began manufacturing motorcycles with his own single-cylinder engines. Early accomplishments include a motorcycle land speed record of 64 miles per hour in 1903 and an unofficial record of 136.36 miles per hour in 1907. 
However, by that point he was already involved in aviation, as in 1904 he had become a supplier of engines to Tom Baldwin, a pioneer in balloons, who built the United States' first successful powered dirigible. In 1907, Curtis joined the Aerial Experiment Association, who were in the process of developing their own aircraft. And needless to say, Curtis' contribution to this was his engines. He was also one of their designers and test pilots. On June 8, 1911, he received U.S. Pilot's License No. 1 from the Aero Club of America, beating out Wilbur Wright, who received License No. 5. He also beat out the Wrights to public demonstrations of aircraft, and on July 4, 1908, he flew 5,080 feet to win the Scientific American Trophy and its $2,500 prize. This was the first pre-announced public flight of a heavier-than-air flying machine in the United States, and propelled Curtis and aviation firmly into public awareness. He can be said to have done more for the public perception of aviation in America than the Wright brothers. So now we're up to date, and with this context it's understandable why he would have wanted to get around the Wright brothers' patent. With the Wright brothers' patent war still raging in 1916, Glenn Curtis looked for a way to prove that the Wrights had not invented lateral control and thus invalidate the 1906 patent. Precisely what researching and investigation he or his team did is not immediately available to me, but the criteria were clear. They had to find an aircraft that predated the 1903 first flight that was not only capable of powered flight, but could also demonstrate lateral control by performing a controlled turn. Even with the benefit of hindsight, computerized records, and relatively easy access to patent information, this is a daunting prospect. How on earth could such an aircraft exist before 1903? Well, enter French engineer Alexandre Goupy. I have not been able to find any biographical information on Alexandre Goupy. However, what we do know is that in 1883 he built a bird-like monoplane glider which seemed stable under a restraining rope. He intended to power it with his new steam engine which weighed about a thousand pounds and produced 15 horsepower. Needless to say, this seems overly optimistic and could never have worked. Goupy ended up making successful unpowered test flights with it. One such test produced enough lift to raise the machine and two pilots into the air under a 14 mile per hour wind. This is impressive for a machine without a power source, which means Goupy was onto something. Unfortunately, for reasons unknown, he didn't pursue further flight tests. It is interesting to speculate what would have happened had he used Félix du Temple de la Croix's compact high-speed circulation steam engine, which had been around since the early 1870s and used in French torpedo boats. At a weight of 39 to 44 pounds per horsepower, his flash boilers might have been able to produce enough power to get the vehicle airborne, and had encouraged du Temple's own monoplane into the air for a brief hop. Weighing in at only 110 pounds, compared with the Du Temple's 180, this seems feasible. The aircraft featured a streamlined bird-shaped hull, tractor propeller, and rudder and horizontal tail aft. It rested on skids. Two stubby horizontal surfaces forward were controlled by the pilots moving around on a pivoted seat, they could work together as elevators or in opposite directions as ailerons, though their purpose was rather to restore lateral balance than to facilitate banking and turning. He called his machine an aeroplane, apparently one of the first to use the name. Clearly, either Glenn Curtis or one of his employees realized the potential of the aircraft and its potential for the installation of an engine. If it had room for a steam engine, then certainly it had room for a more modern aircraft engine that would weigh much less and produce more power. 
So Curtis had his Buffalo, New York factory build the duck from Goupy's original patent drawings and a description in La Locomotion Aérienne. Curtis put it first on wheels instead of skids like the original, and then on floats, and then again on wheels. The engine selected was the Curtis OXX-6, which weighed 600 pounds less than the steam engine proposed by Goupy, and at 100 horsepower was much, much more powerful. On the 19th of January 1917, it took to the air for the first time, succeeding initially in a straight and level flight, and then in a circle. As with his rebuilt Langley Aerodrome, Curtis made some significant changes to the original, control linkages, engines, and longer wings than what Goupy seems to have intended, but the basic design remained the same, probably sufficient to prove that lateral control significantly predated the Wright brothers' patent. But Curtis never got to make use of his evidence that the Wrights were not the first to invent lateral control. The Curtis-Wright patent fight was settled by arbitration in 1917 as U.S. involvement in World War I escalated.